Well, hello, everyone. Welcome to this uh, Dyslexia Initiative, California Dyslexia Initiative webinar series. I'm Tammy Wilson from the Sacramento County Office of Education, and I'm the project lead on the California Dyslexia Initiative. We are really excited to have folks here from across our state and even from other states joining us in this learning opportunity. Um, hopefully you have seen some of the other webinars in our series. And today we are really excited to have you join us for today's webinar featuring Dr. Marianne Wolf. There is a lot of wonderful content to be explored and I know you're going to learn a lot. Make sure that you access our Padlet to find the slides and also our California Dyslexia Initiative website where we house um, companion documents so you can explore this topic deeper. And we'll uh, be posting the webinar recording as soon as it's ready. So the goals of the California Dyslexia Initiative, uh, if you could move to the next slide, are really around providing professional learning opportunities across California's system of support. So we can really support early intervention um, and supports for students with specific learning disabilities, including dyslexia, um, and also to provide some evidence-based professional development and to partner with schools and districts and other county offices in our state to really provide professional learning resources and other information. As part of this webinar series, we have partnered with Jessica Hammond, the founder and CEO of Glean Education, who is doing an amazing job of coordinating our webinar series. And I'm gonna hand it off to Jessica to get us started. Thank you, Tammy. We are thrilled to partner with SCOE and the California Dyslexia Initiative to coordinate this webinar series. For those of you who may not know about us at Glean Education, we partner with schools, districts, and states to deliver online training, school leader consulting, and web-based coaching. Our work aims to build educator understanding of evidence-based literacy practices to improve student literacy outcomes. You can move to the next slide, please. This webinar is the sixth in a series of webinars on dyslexia and literacy delivered by some of the nation's top experts in the field. If you haven't already registered for them, we'll be popping some registration links in the chat, so be sure not to miss them. Next slide, please. So it is my absolute pleasure to introduce today Dr. Mary Ann Wolf. She is a scholar, a teacher, and an advocate for children and literacy around the world. She's director of the newly created Center for Dyslexia, Diverse Learners, and Social Justice at the UCLA School of Education and Information Studies. Previously, she was the John D. Biagio Professor of Citizenship and Public Service in the Elliott Pearson Department of Child Study and Human Development at Tufts University. She is the author of several books, including Proust and the Squid, The Story of Science of the Reading Brain, Dyslexia, Fluency, and the Brain, Tales of Literacy for the 21st Century, and Reader Come Home, The Reading Brain in a Digital World. She has also published articles in over 170 research publications. She's the recipient of the highest awards for research and teaching from multiple professional organizations and was recently elected to the Pontifical Academy of Science. Please help us welcome Dr. Marianne Wolf. Thank you so much, Jessica, and thank you, Tommy and Uyen and Deirdre from SCOE. Um, it is just a pleasure to be with you. And I really want to welcome all of you who are spending time on, on days that seem to have no end for you with me. So I want to make this a happy occasion. I even decided to wear a red dress just to wake you up at this hour. But I also wanted to begin with the thought that what my job is to give you information that we hope will be transformed into knowledge. And knowledge, I want you to think about, not in the ways that perhaps that we had in graduate school, but knowledge as joy and knowledge as something that can give us the basis of doing our best. 
So I want you to think about as knowledge as something that is uh, something we give away that we both possess and give away. But I also want to put it together with something that we have to teach our children and remind ourselves. And that is we have to have persistence. And persistence gives us courage, but it also gives us power because we don't just look at what didn't work, we keep going. And that's why I'm going to actually give you uh, 40 minutes of what I consider both the science and the poetry about learning about knowledge, about the reading brain as a way to understand reading development, not only in dyslexia, but how all of this work together can help all our children. So I'm so privileged to be able to be part of this dyslexia series. It's, I saw all my friends up there and Mary Lou Gorno is coming next. So it's just very special to be almost like a fraternity sorority of people giving you knowledge that we want you to use. Um, I come to you from UCLA where we have one mission in our Center for Dyslexia Diverse Learners and Social Justice that goes across all the different collaboratives we do in neurodiversity and learning and juvenile justice. Thanks to the state of California, by the way, I'm so proud to be a new member of your state. And that mission that unites everything is that we consider literacy a basic human right across every zip code, every neighborhood in LA, across the state, across the country, and in some of our work across our world. We are also working on global literacy. Why? Why this enormous emphasis? For me, I was always thinking about the Kurt Vonnegut line that what does an artist do, but tells, tells the public like a canary in the mine that there's something wrong in the mine. Well, literacy, when it doesn't develop, is like a canary in the mind. It tells us what isn't functioning yet there that we can do something about. But it begins from my standpoint with the absolute premise and reality that literacy changes your brain, changes the brain, that changes the individual, that changes the society, that changes the future of our species. And even though that won't be part of my talk today, I cannot not say that part of my work on literacy is because we need the deepest forms of literacy to preserve democracy through our critical analysis and empathy. And I will talk to you about that. But literacy is changing. And even though today's talk is not about how digital uh, culture changes us, I hope some of you read some of my work and read or come home about that. In this talk, I'm really emphasizing the reading brain and dyslexia as something that will help all children learn to read. Now, one of the first questions is, what is dyslexia? And do we have a unified, absolutely perfect definition of it? No, we do not. Rather, I want you to think about it as a group of different forms of challenges, most of which are based on different brain organizations and that persist despite every, every, if, if you will, every measure of intelligence, which is just like everybody else's bell-shaped curve, though I must say I am prejudiced in a particular way because I have so many examples in my life, including the painting behind me, of people who are dyslexic and gifted in so many ways. So even though I don't want to have you think that you have to be gifted if you're dyslexic, you are intelligent. And one of the absolute most important things is that no child, just as Governor Newsom has said to so many people in his talks, he was considered dumb. He considered himself 
less than average because of this. We must never let another person experience what Governor Newsom or my son experienced or so many of our children. But I want to emphasize that we are talking about heterogeneity in dyslexia. And we have to be able to figure out very early on, how do we find out about the risk factors, not only for dyslexia, but for reading in general. So part of our work is understanding what the screening, assessment, diagnosis, and intervention and instruction. How do we put this knowledge to work on that? And we do that in our work by being translators between cognitive neuroscience and education. But we have a second goal, and that is we do not live in an ivory tower. We work in schools. We work in school systems and districts. And it's important for us to be always having a reciprocal relationship between educators, you who are watching this. How do we address the questions that are most important to you? And how, when we do our research, do we form relationships so that we are never just coming in and out, but being responsive and responsible to the questions that are across our state, across our country, on how do we make all children literate? Now, in today's talk, it's a, it's a, it's, it's a quick one, but I, I hope I'll be able to help you understand, even in a short way, how the brain learns to read and how this helps us understand reading development and how it helps us understand that dyslexia can disrupt different forms of the reading brain because the reading brain is a circuit, and we'll talk about that in just a minute. But we want to know, how can we take all this knowledge that we're building and use it in conjunction with the knowledge that our teachers and our parents have about risk and protective factors? How can we take all this knowledge to give better instruction, to give better screeners, to give better intervention and that's really important so we're looking at the whole child all the time but now we use cognitive neuroscience to do that in large part because i have found in my work at the reading harvard reading lab many years ago that just as my colleague stanislaus Tahan said that when we understand the reading brain circuit we actually simplify the teacher's task because we get to know the parts that we need to understand how they're developing, how well they're developing, or, or whether they are developing. And that's across all languages. Now, the reading circuit, just think of your house. Your house has to have all these connections. Well, the brain does too. Now, what's interesting about reading, there's no one place for it. There's no one gene for it. There is nothing that's just a plop on the map of the circuit and say, that's reading. No, it's a circuit of connecting major parts. And that circuit is going to look different according to your languages. So if we look at English and alphabets, you're going to have certain parts that are going to be emphasized. But if you speak Chinese or Japanese kanji, you're going to use actually more of your visual areas in both hemispheres than you do in English or alphabetic systems. Now, why do I tell you anything about that? Because I need to emphasize that circuit is plastic. Because there's no genes, it means that the brain uses one of its best design principles and makes a plastic circuit that will reflect not just the writing system, but how you teach. The educational emphases will change how that circuit works. Your methods are important. The medium, another talk, but the medium itself has different characteristics or affordances and will emphasize either very rapid processing or slower processing to get at some of the more, if you will, sophisticated processes involved. I wish I had hours with you, but do read some of the other work I have 
to understand how the medium, that digital culture that we all depend so much on during COVID has ramifications for how we read. But I want you to look at just a few slides with me about how the young brain, before reading ever occurs, has to develop in that zero to five period. And I need to say inequity begins here in the zero to five period. I, if I could have a campaign across the state, it would be to connect all the wonderful efforts and initiatives you're having about what are the parts that will go and ultimately get connected in the reading circuit that we as a society have to help our parents of all economic circumstances, of all languages, help develop in our young. Now, all of us know so much about how important language is, but it's different aspects of language that we need to always emphasize. And I use the term possum, that ugly marsupial read line always calls, why do you use the word possum? You can remember possum, but possum stands for understanding that language development includes understanding the sounds and representing the sounds of whatever language you're speaking. Whatever that first language or the first two languages, make them strong, make them the platform for any other language they have to learn later. This is a really important part to be a multilingual person, a bilingual person, an emerging language learner is one of the most wonderful preparations for a better brain when you're an adult. But there are things along the way that we have to do to help develop it. Phoneme awareness is another way of talking about one of the things we have to emphasize. But what I want you to realize is that we need, we need to have exposures to the phonemes of whatever the language is. We need to have exposure to the words for the words are developing the child's language regions and the words are connected to concepts and concepts are connected to the background knowledge that a child brings to bear when they are reading. And there is nothing more ominous for me when I realized for years we've had all this data about how whether we're talking about vocabulary and background knowledge, the rich get richer and the poor get poor. But they aren't just about cognitive and linguistic poverty. It's also social and emotional. When we have children who are hearing words after words after words, hearing stories read to them, they are getting all of these areas of the brain activated. Every story introduces information, not just about con concepts, but about how creatures feel, how others think. So we're leaving the egocentrism that is the natural domain of childhood. Piaget certainly made us all know that. But as Vygotsky said, you know, there's this social element that is happening during this zero to five period. And there's nothing better than books like Frog and Toad and Charlotte's Web. All of these books from zero to 10 are building this, if you will, what Martha Nussbaum calls the compassionate imagination of childhood, understanding who others are, that, that others have thoughts and feelings could not be more important to our ever connected planet. And fiction, I, I love fiction in particular because it allows us to think what others think and gives us words that we are not necessarily exposed to. For decades, I have shown this slide. That's how old this slide is. I don't care how old it is. I have to repeat it and but give you new research in saying that there's this gap that exists that must not exist if we are to get rid of some of the sources of inequity in our children. And the more privileged the family is, even though this is not an economic argument, some of my migrant families know all this and give all the words, but so often, we don't get enough language. We don't get enough exposure to words over and over. So there's a gap that exists. And this gap has been studied in so many ways by my colleagues, John Gabrielli, Catherine hirsch pasick done with neuroimaging, done with qualitative analysis. It's all amounting to a gap before the kids come even.
to preak. We need to know that Heckman in the University of Chicago showed the highest rate of return for our investment is in that early childhood. And from the pediatricians like Reach Out and Read, we know the language regions of children who are being read to are developing not only in the receptive areas, but in the expressive areas. Why do I say all this? Because each part is playing a role in its development in the ultimate coming together of the reading circuit to make a decoding brain. We need all those parts in zero to five being developed by our society. And then, then if you look at this slide in front of you, you'll see that all these parts actually are not necessarily connected. That's our job. We want to connect all that and we want to connect it so that they become automatic. Now, I need to do something that is going to step on the toes of people or maybe massage those toes, but it has to be said. This world has been polarized, this reading world, the reading methods world has been polarized too long and so unnecessarily because the reading brain teaches us that those foundational skills that we see in that first part of that reading brain they are all important for us to have now 40 50 60 depending on the uh, of, of our schools could have any reading method but by and large 40 50 60 percent of most kids need explicit systematic structured work on those foundational skills now when i talk about the unnecessary reading war we have been split as if the children have those lower rungs of the foundational skills able to be induced by just reading stories, good stories. Well, for some of the kids that works. And I love the dedication to books. I, I, have, two, I have two degrees in English literature. I love how literature helps us, but it doesn't necessarily work for 40 to 60% of our kids to induce the foundational skills. But I need to say something to every teacher, not just our balanced literacy and whole language experts on, on, on literature, but our, our, our wonderful teachers who have been dedicating themselves to getting what would be called foundational skills, phonics, decoding skills, structured, explicit. We need to have a broader view, a more comprehensive view. So that it's not just phoneme awareness, but phoneme awareness that's connected to orthographic letter pattern knowledge, that is connected to knowledge of words, that is connected to knowledge of how words work syntactically within sentences and stories, and how morphemes add like secret sauce to everything. So that the alphabetic principle, which is at the core of foundational skills, is being connected to all of these other things. So we have no necessity for a war, but we must not cherry pick. This is the hard line where some toes are going to be hurting. We must be explicit, systematic about the knowledge we already have in teaching those foundational skills and other toes might be hurting right now. We must be connecting it to what our teachers in balanced literacy and whole language have been emphasizing vocabulary and syntax and stories. It should not be disconnected. The reading brain shows us that it is developing so that it becomes ever more elaborated. So these foundational skills, we have to work on them so they're automatic and become a bridge to an ever more elaborated deep reading brain. Now the deep reading processes are really important for me to be able to talk to you because it's where science and poetry comes together. Every child has to be able to have enough background knowledge to connect the word to what they know. Connie Jewell said this years ago, the biggest mistake in early re teaching of reading is to think that when a child decodes the word, they know it. That, it's just not the way it works. It is so often the case that whether we're talking about our emergent language learners or learners who have a, have a, a linguistic poverty in their, in their background, we 
have to realize what we are doing is helping build that background knowledge as, as, as teachers. And we are analogy makers. So we are constantly going from what we know to what we see. But we're also people of feeling. And I can't emphasize enough that these stories, however vocabulary controlled the ones that I write, there are really crazy stories like duck, duck. They have two words in them. And yet we can use all of these stories to be able ultimately to teach what it means to be an other person with another consciousness, whether it's fiction or novel, it's the passing over from one mind to the next. Why is that a piece of the reading circuit? It's one of the most important ways that we build a circuit. We are building it with background knowledge and inference. We're taking our analogies from what we know to what is new. We're making inferences and deductions very importantly for this moment in our history. We are making hypotheses about the truth value. We must teach our children not only literacy in, in one medium and digital literacy, in, but we must teach them to think about evaluating. This is what critical analysis is. One frontal lobe, right, left, is making a hypothesis. Yes, no, refute. Give it an imprimatur. Yes, that's the truth. Or no, we are teaching the discernment. And here I'm going to give the novelist um, Marilyn Robinson a very quick um, this is just such a beautiful passage because it, it, it embodies what I want for all our readers. As they reach that point where all this is elaborated, if God has taken pleasure in his creation, it is in your best idea, your most disciplined thinking on whatever is true, honorable, just, pleasing, and worthy of praise. That's what the reading brain is meant to do. It's meant to think, and we have to give it time we have to make it automatic so that it's able to elaborate and think. That is the basis of the novel thought that is often gone missing in our children with dyslexia. It goes missing because we have not gotten our children by fourth grade fluent enough to be able to reach this deep reading. Deep reading takes time in its formation, but it also takes time for you. That's another, another talk. But for our children with dyslexia, we have to make them fluent enough so we can release this extraordinary set of, of minds. And whether we look at all the people who are entrepreneurs or, or artists, and if you look at the bottom, there's this one you won't recognize. I will show you again. This is just one of all the many entrepreneurs and artists who who really tell us, help tell us what dyslexia is in all its multiple forms. Leonardo da Vinci, if I had a time machine, was undoubtedly one of the most interesting dyslexic minds we have, thinking outside the box, doing everything. But did he have word retrieval problems like the ones that I measure with RAN and rapid automatizers? He had retrieval problems with Latin. He could not learn Latin. His geometry was fabulous. His algebra was terrible. Leonardo da Vinci personifies the constellation of strengths and weaknesses that we have to understand in terms of risk and protective factors. There is, there is a, a, a wonderful example that I just learned about from Linda Darling Hammond about her son. I did not know her son, Sean, was dyslexic. This is an extraordinary man. I, I, I was listening to him and I did not realize he was dyslexic, but he personifies the same extraordinary mix of strength and weaknesses like our governor, like my son. And what we have to understand is we have to understand the combination, the whole child. And that's what people like Mary Lou Gordon, Tiffany, your next speaker, Famico Haft, all these people who are doing such wonderful work at UCSF Medical Center, the Dyslexia Center, we're all working together on looking at the whole of it. What protects, what is the resiliency? And the resiliency is something that maybe my son was able to build. Maybe Linda Darling Hammond's son was, uh, was able to build because we were advocates for our children. 
you are going to be with children and individuals who do not have those advocates and you are becoming the advocate. And so we want to use this in integrative approach to understand that so many of our children, I don't use the term one out of five, but we have at least 10% of our kids. And if we look at it before they're even born, we see that there are differences in the families of children with dyslexia. There are differences in the connective, in the connections in that circuitry before the circuit forms itself. But we have a paradox. We know all this, and yet we do not identify usually until two or three, greater two or three. I have, uh, I don't even want to tell you how many times a week I hear from 13 year olds, 14 year olds, 15 year olds, people who weren't diagnosed. Part of the reason why they weren't diagnosed is because they were outside the box of a of a, a unified dimension of what is called dyslexia. And we're gonna talk about that in just a second. But the paradox is that we know how to screen and predict, and yet our interventions don't even go into effect sometimes till second or third grade when we know that early intervention is best. And I'm gonna just say this really quickly. We have all kinds of great research on early predictors. Phoneme awareness, if you see on the RAND, actually that was my work with my advisor, Martha Denkla, the RAND RAS task. What are those tasks? Those tasks are simply making a mini circuit in the brain before reading happens. That's why it's so important. It's not just about aiming speed, it's about a mini circuit. And that mini circuit we have to investigate, not just through one test, we have to investigate, but it helps us predict. And it's not just phonemes. It's not just retrieval speed of, of what how that circuit is connecting visual and language regions. It can be in other areas too. And I love the new work of Jason Yateman, who said basically that our models that were so used, so useful that only emphasize phonology they're simply insufficient. He's been showing work in the visual word form area that, that we, we have tasks there that are measuring things that go beyond the typical RAN or phoneme awareness. And what we're doing is looking at how can we predict this? How can we look at this before reading happens, before the social emotional detritus happens and our kids feel their failures in first and second grade? Well, we want to go in and have been doing this work in New England on predictors. And we've got about six different profiles. Two of them are average or gifted kids. But I want to only emphasize one for you here. If you look at the green line, those children are almost as good as the gifted. They're never going to get diagnosed. Except if you look at the RAM, the speed with which the circuit comes together is different in these children phenomenally so and that lasts forever it gets a little better over time but those children will have fluency issues and what we have to do is figure out what is what is further causing that but then what do we do this is where i really get up so excited because we're reaching at a point where our knowledge can make sure that we don't have these great divides between phonics emphases and whole language or balanced emphases. We don't need it because we have already showed that if you reverse engineer the reading brain, you are able to be explicitly looking at all those major parts. I'll only give you one tiny example from, it happens to be our research program intervention, but I, I use it as only a way to say, we want to take the parts of the reading circuit that could go wrong, that need emphases, as a way of making a whimsical set of metacognitive strategies to help children learn how to connect. That's the magic word, how to connect phonology, orthography, semantic syntax. Now, when we do our what we call multi-component interventions, now these are randomized controlled trial studies, the gold standard and so difficult. When I do these studies with my dear colleagues, Maureen Lovett and, Maureen, uh, and, and Robin Morris, we find that when we look at the, just the, the typical 
the classroom versus the classroom that's only doing but very good work on phonics, the multi-component goes beyond them. Even more importantly, when we do it at grade one, we get phenomenally better results than when we begin later. Now just think social emotionally. These kids are already really feeling like they have their failures by third and fourth grade. We need to think about screening. We need to think about social emotional issues so much better than what we have, but not just social emotional, not just cognitive. We also need to know about the environment because we are also looking at how the research on social economic status alone, language status, language impoverishment in the home, all of this makes a, 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 a very important very important statement that I have to make now. We have been guilty of inequity for decades. And now we have a chance to look at the data and we can see without, we cannot blink our eye when we see that 61% of our African American kids, particularly the boys, it's not that they're not reaching proficiency and fluency, they're not doing basic levels in grade four. That's not about dyslexia. But that is something that, because of our work on dyslexia, we can take these forgotten boys. Sean Robinson has done some beautiful work on this. We can take these forgotten boys and we can do something early on. And so in, with the Office of Special Education, we're doing what we call a Teddy study, where we take screeners, digital screeners, One we're using one that Nadine Gab has, um, uh, has used, we will hope to use the UCSF, a Florida State University a screener called Multitudes. That's all being tested right now as well. But we want to take these screeners. Now remember those profiles? There's different profiles of strengths and weaknesses. It's not about identifying children with dyslexia at five. No, it's identifying areas of strength, weaknesses, risk factors, and resiliency and using that information with our teachers who know so much and then using that as the basis for targeted intervention in grade one. We're using tier two interventions with small groups and then if we find this is insufficient, we do further diagnosis and potentially tier three intervention. But the point is not to over identify a single soul but to give new extensive information about strengths and weaknesses to our teachers so they can have a better shot in grade one with tier two and grade two with grade with tier two if they need it or tier three. And so we're looking at our profiles with digital. And if you look at what we found, we found with a 20 minute digital screener, the same profiles that we had with a 30 to 40 measures with uh, Ola Ozernoff, Palchik, John Gabrielli, the big prediction study I showed you earlier. So what are, we, what, are we, what are we learning about this? I want three areas of systemic change for dyslexia and all our readers. I want a campaign to bring all our initiatives together at Zero to Five to increase language, social, emotional, and, and cognitive development during that time period. I want every parent to be reading to their children and if they're a non-literate and many are we use picture books we want to use our pediatricians with reach out and read but we want at age five to be able to offer not mandatory but offer the opportunity to give our children our screening remember not to over identify not to over identify our children who are language learners or, or our children of color. It's never about that. It's about looking at the whole child and using that information from assessment to teach our teachers how best to give targeted intervention. And Rebecca Silverman at Stanford and I will be with, because of Linda Darlingham, it's wonderful um, initiatives. We're gonna try to be pulling some of this together as recommendations for people. But number three, don't give up at age three and four. Our, our, our teachers weren't trained. We have to train grades four to 12, how to identify and what to do with our older readers as well. 
So we want a complete plan, and we want a plan that changes our conceptualization of dyslexia from local schools to cities. We're working with LA Unified to the beautiful state initiatives. My goodness, even at, at one in, in our tiny little center, we are working as a collaborative with California State University, Sue Sears and others, to make a collaborative on neurodiversity and learning that gives better information to our pre-service and in-service teachers. That's one state initiative. I know the, uh, I don't say SCOE, but <laughs> I know you do, the Sacramento uh, Department of Education, Offices of Education, GLEAN. Um, there's so many things that are going on at the state level that are so important to drive the rest of this and to link it not only to our state, but where, where California goes, so goes the country. I will also say the same about Ohio. And now I'm gonna to have to end. And I wanna end with looking at, do you see this man on the left and columns of color? That's what you see behind you. This is my dyslexic son who I had to go at some point to six different schools to find the right school for him. Once, because he felt so rejected, I had to go to a police department because he was putting graffiti under an old bridge. I have gone through the same struggles that many parents have because our children didn't have the right resources. But thanks to him, and I did this research, I have to say, before he was born, but thanks to him, I learned what it felt like to be dyslexic. I learned what Governor Newsom talks about. I want all of us to look at this psalm and to realize we can change the conceptualization of dyslexia and we must. The stone that the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. Last Saturday night, one of the professors from the Harvard School of Design saw my son's most recent show at on the jasper trees oh it's unbelievable it's in palm springs the pit some of you should look it up ben wolf know him she said this is a genius <laughs> i don't know if he's a genius but he is dyslexic and his very brain organization that made him dyslexic gave him all of these advantages that leonardo da vinci had that so many of our entrepreneurs and so many of the children you teach have, we must never lose that potential. So I end with this last slide. Um, this information is not just about dyslexia, never has been and never will be in my work, in my center's work with Laura Reinhardt and Rebecca Gottlieb and Veronica Pedrosa and Trang Nguyen. We have what you have. We have a responsibility and a charge to release the potential of all our children using this knowledge. Knowledge is joy, knowledge is power, but persistence is essential for all of us. And I'll end with two quotes from two poets. Novelist Marilyn Robinson said, the greatest test ever made of human wisdom and decency may very well come to this time or the next. We must teach and learn broadly and seriously. That's what this knowledge about dyslexia gives all our children. And now I want to end with Amanda Gorman, our amazing poet who at the inauguration said this, for while we have our eyes on the future, history has its eyes on us. I take that as our charge, our mutual test, and I say to you, Godspeed, and thank every single one of you for listening to this and taking this knowledge to heart as well as to mind. Thank you for your work. And now Dr. Wolf, we go back. <laughs> thank you for that amazingly inspiring 
presentation and, and the, all the information therein. So thank you so much. We are gifted with 15 minutes for questions. So we will use that time to pick your brain. But before we do, I'd like to mention the companion document that we have created to accompany each of these webinars. The webinar companion document includes discussion prompts and all sorts of things to kind of dig further into this content. So please take a look at it. The document can be found at scoey.net slash CA dyslexia. And then if you would turn just to the next slide, on that slide is our, um, is our survey. And that is the way in which, Dr. Wolf, would you kindly turn to the next slide if you can? That is the survey that we will be able to um, get your information and your feedback on this webinar. So if you could take a minute while we're asking questions to fill out that survey, that would be excellent. Thank you so much. And Wynn will also pop that survey link in the chat. Um, so we did receive some wonderful questions from the audience. And one of the first ones that I read was, can you point to some research on early intervention regarding literacy for multilingual learners? Mm, good question. So we are working right now to um, gather some of the people who are, have done such beautiful work in that. And the first I have to mention is the work of Young Sook Kim at Irvine, uh, the work of Allison Bailey at UCLA, the work of Claude Goldenberg at Stanford. All of these people are doing work right now. And Claude Goldenberg just literally just uh, talked to me yesterday about really trying to pull together some of the work on literacy and multilingual uh, learners. Um, I, I, I know with Young Sook Kim, we want very much to be able to uh, be thinking about assessment issues with our multilingual learners, our emergent learners, and what inter and have translations of them, obviously, in, in, in this, ultimately in as many languages as, as our major in California but certainly in Spanish as soon as possible. I know that the screener we're using, we are looking at the differences. We're doing research on our bilingual learners. We're using uh, uh, the lab school at UCLA as a, and Fernandulus, a Title I school, to examine some of these differences on an English-speaking screener, for example. But we really want to, we want to investigate so many different aspects of this. As I mentioned, there's going to be an initiative that uh, Rebecca Silverman and I sponsor. People like Claude Goldenberg and uh, Young Sook, Allison, and others. There's so many good people who are doing work on the multilingual issues, and that has to happen. Um, we have to, uh, th this will be a strong vector of our research in the future. You spoke a little bit about Sean Robinson's work and the Forgotten Boys. Yeah, and oh, I love him. <laughs> we were wondering if you could elaborate a bit oh, on that. Yeah. So he has a special issue. Uh, Sean is himself dyslexic. Um, he is a huge, I have to say, he, he's a very, he, he won't mind me saying this. He's a huge, handsome dude, and he calls himself Dr. Dyslexia Dude and makes cartoon characters. And, and work on especially fourth grade upwards of African-American boys. Um, so he's been, he, uh, he has a special interest as an African-American dyslexic himself uh, and male. And so he, is, he has, um, I did a preface for a special issue on reading and writing on this. So please look up Sean Robinson. And I think I, I use the word forgotten boys because Jean Chawl, my former um, mentor and advisor at Harvard Reading Lab, before she died, said one of the most important things in American research today has to be understanding why we have such a failure to teach fourth grade African American boys. So Sean Robinson has done such a, a, a good job. And, I, I hope you, you, you have him in your dyslexia series next year. <laughs> it 
It's a great suggestion. He is, he is a possibility. So I'm so glad you spoke about him a bit. So thank you. And speaking of fourth grade and older children regarding dyslexia, we have a question about suggestions for how to provide instruction for adolescents with dyslexia. Do you have any suggestions oh, about interventions? I'm or? so glad you asked me this. And because I had to race through my slides and I couldn't elaborate in several places that I wanted to, especially about the older readers. So there's all kinds of good things going on. And let me let me talk about four. I'll keep myself to four. First, there's powerful uh, randomized control trial studies showing how the research called Empower by Maureen Lovett and her group in Toronto has wonderful um, effect sizes for this older group. Now that's a more inclusive program, has to have well-trained. So that's a little harder. I, I really want LA Unified to know more about this. I want the state to know more about this. Second, uh, my colleague and a dear friend, and she's become such a dear friend since I moved to California, but she is my best colleague in the collaborative on diversity, neurodiversity and learning. And she's at CSUN and she's helping um, do two things. One, she's helping a, a task force look at pre-service, bringing more of the science of reading together into syllabi for in pre-service in California, it's CSUs, and we're doing that in UCLA. But she's also done something under the Office of Special Education everybody can use now and i think la unified is making that available but it's called it's free it's called the word builder and you know one of the hardest things for older readers is the words are, are too long and so it's helping understand how to attack words that are uh, uh, multi-syllabic but it's it, it's of course it's subtle it's it's not only at, at attacking it at a word recognition level but at a comprehension level as well you know how do we use this information to figure out morphemes etc so those are two biggies that I absolutely recommend now a third one and a fourth one are apps now I have a lot of things to say about digital that is negative but I also am an advocate of it especially with dyslexic older readers who need practice so rally um, is a, a program um, that is working on fluency for fourth graders up. And that's a really beautiful uh, program that I, I really would like people to know more about. Another app, and it, this is, remember, when I talk about the reading circuit, I'm talking about all the parts. So Rally works, uh, uh, works really well on getting things automatic, at the, especially at the lower levels. But Bookalicious is just such a, a powerful app that matches the reading level, the developmental level of the reader with the interest level. So there's this avatar and, and you get to choose books now. And I, and I gave a talk to the Institute for Library Science or the Museum and Library Services only two days ago. And I mentioned this, really look up Bookalicious because the, it's just a fun way to connect a book a suggestion, remember agency, choice, a, a suggestion of books that match the interest and the lexile level of that child, especially for older readers who need this so desperately. They need to get excited and engaged. So finding the right books, well, this book, Alicious, connects to the libraries or, or a publisher. So you can actually buy a book too but especially to the libraries so that it, it is it can be free for the kids. So those are four suggestions um, uh, for older readers that I really am so glad for that question. And where can Word Builder be found? Uh, just online. Okay, great, thank you. Yeah, and that's through Sears Group at CSUN. You spoke a lot about the importance of early skill building from zero to five and how critical that time is. Do you have any suggestions for how that time can be used well and how to support that type of skill building at that early stage? Yes, I have two suggestions. And once I was given two minutes in a Boston uh, TV station to, to give advice, I said, two things, talk to your kids, read to your kids. <laughs> now, of course, what I really meant and had only two minutes to say 
is that so often young parents, especially parents who have two jobs, three jobs, don't realize that they are one of the best teachers the child can ever have, whether they are literate or not. They are talking to their child. They often don't realize that a child's um, auditory system is even prenatally, you know, that auditory um, uh, area, nerve is, is, is myelinating ahead of other things prenatally, I think two months before. Um, now, why do I say such a, such a seemingly odd piece of it? Because that means they're going to be developing and listening to your language from the start. And the more you talk and the more you read to them, the better they are getting these phonies and these, these semantic connections. Now, the read every night is what I would like to begin at least at six months on. And I mean it as a ritual for tenderness, for affection, for giving the child your love of learning, but also as what the pediatricians say, giving it a chance for dialogic reading. Now, if you, if, no, 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 please, I have to do this fast. If you think of, of neural imaging the brain of a three-year-old or a four-year-old who's from a very low income area, and you just want to see what effects there are. If you read to your child, you will see dramatic differences between the children who are read to or not. Now, I'm going to add another new study by John Hutton, who is part of the Cincinnati group. And they gave the same story, read to the child in that dialogic way where the parent is doing all these things and elaborating and, and eliciting. And then they compared that story just to an audio story or to a bells and whistles video, you know, on an iPad. Well, I wish we could have a hands up on what was the better activation of the brain because hands down, the person, the person reading activated, it showed far more activation and audio was next. And last was that iPad that was full of bells and whistles, which passively you know, gives information and gives fun, but doesn't elicit, doesn't demand, uh, or doesn't give a chance, an opportunity for the imagination of the child to be at work. And so there's so many things. In fact, tomorrow I'm giving a talk at Santa Barbara on uh, attention um, and distraction in our children. And so we've got so much to, to do, but talk, read. Talk, read. It builds language, concepts, and social emotional development. Fascinating. And so we have time for one last question, and I will take one from the Q&A. Do you have any tips on differentiating between a student who is truly dyslexic and a student who is linguistically poor at home? And how, how to differentiate them in, in your yeah, support? That's a really important, very, very important um, uh, question. The reality is that we, the imperfection is still there. I want to say imperfection, but if that child is given a retrieval task to simply name five objects 10 times in an array or colors, but especially objects, because the objects are so simple that no matter what the language background is, they would know it. That will give us an index of the circuits, connections between visual and um, language regions. So even if the child has very little language enrichment at home, they will know these objects and we will be able to deduce whether or not the speed of the circuit is a risk factor. That is not saying that person will have dyslexic. There is no question that that gives us a red flag that we can then, as over time, be able to, to follow that. And one of the most interesting things that we have is that we give uh, RAN, not only RAN letters, numbers, colors, and objects, but we give what's called a rapid alternating stimulus task, and that gets at some of the attention issues that kids have. So in six in six little tests that can take all of five minutes to give all of them, we're really, and, and, and I have to say, though, remember, this test was first 
uh, a lab test by Martha Danklin, Rita Riddell. Then it became my dissertation. Then Martha and I published it. Um, everybody's copied it. You know, they, a lot of times they copy it incorrectly. They give too few stimuli. Some people only give 12. Some people give 36. Some people call it phonology. All of that is an in, infelicitous, inaccurate view of what it is. What we want to see, and that's the answer to your question, is how fast the circuit gets connected, regardless of language poverty or not. Okay? So that's one of the ones that he would say. Now, Jason Yegman would probably uh, talk about some visual motion, um, also areas that would have little to do with language as such. Um, so uh, I'm looking forward to learning much more about what some of his work is showing. But we're talking about heterogeneity here, heterogeneity. Well, we had someone in the chat say that Dr. Wolf never disappoints, and I agree with that 100%. Uh, thank you so very much for your time today, and thank you to the Sacramento County Office of Education and the California Dyslexia Initiative for allowing us to learn from these amazing minds. So thank you to everyone who's attended as well and made time for this important work. And come back to hear Mary Lou Gorno Tiffany. She's great. <laughs> Thank you all. Bye, everybody. Bye. Best wishes. Godspeed to you all. Thank you. Thank you for your work.